Here again I sit with the breath of air. He refused to let me quit. Get right is the name, and in the sky it shines bright. And if I could do the same, I refuse to lay down because I have a chance to rebound. And all I want to do is show you that I can do that for me and then you too. They call me Get Right, and that's what I call myself to do and get it right. And I do it for me and you. Thank you. Hot, hot, hot. I'm I trying not to interrupt. I'm I trying not to interrupt. Yo, I'm, I'm trying not to interrupt. Yo, I'm trying not to interrupt. I'm trying not to interrupt. I'm trying not to interrupt. Yo, yo, I'm trying not to interrupt. Yo, yo, I'm trying not to interrupt. Signs telling me no, but my body, my body's telling me yeah. Ah, what happened? I don't know, this is crazy. It's not even a subject or, or anything. Where the fuck is R. Kelly? What the fuck is, where the fuck is R. Kelly? Jail? Yeah, but a lot of people are in jail. Oh, yeah. A lot of people are in jail, but they still stay out of the news. You know what I mean? They're not out of TMZ and everything. Yeah, what I'm, like, I don't even want to talk about R. Kelly. I just started singing that song, but he just disappeared. Certain things, sometimes I think in life, something Something tragic can happen. There's something more tragic happens. Just squash everything. That's true. I think if anybody was happy that COVID hit the streets, it was R. Kelly. That's true. COVID was the only thing that kept R. Kelly out of the fucking news. Yeah. R. Yeah. Kelly, what the fuck? We talked about this before. And it's, un- it's unfortunate that you can have, say, an artist that you grew up on, you know, that for some reason has had a troubled life. Or some of the evils that he's done are to light now, and it kind of their celebrity fades, and the respect you have for him fade. It's happening for white people right now. What? Yeah, Woody Allen. There's a new documentary. Woody Allen's still alive. Woody Allen's still alive. Yeah. Okay. Now, okay. Now, damn. It didn't take total. So it didn't take me no time to make this a black-white issue. No time at all. <laughs> Why is it that the pervs in the black community? get treated different than the pervs in the white community. Deary, you being a white guy, and you're responsible, you represent all white people, okay? All of them, Deary. Do they know that I'm Jewish? Because that could be Man, an issue. Man, fuck that, that's still white. You know what the fuck I mean. You know, you represent all white wait, people now. Wait, can I just say, wait, Donnell, just for the, just for the record, mm-hmm. you know the white people that like, they, they wave those like Confederate flags and the white people that are like, on a certain angle, like real, real white, like yeah. white genocide people. Yeah, I'm not white to them. I know you're not okay. white to them. Just, just so, just okay. So okay, let's be clear. You're not white to them, but to right. us, I get it. Meaning yeah. African Americans, right. my niggas and them, my mans and them, you're white. I know. We, we like it becomes your boy. Anything. Oh, that ain't my boy though. No, I'm not talking about you and your community. I'm talking about the perception black people have. Okay. And, you know what I'm okay. saying? And it it's the same perception white people have about black people. Right. You know what I'm saying? Anytime, and not to say, I am a, I, I like Barack Obama, right? But anytime he did anything, it was like, your boy. So <laughs> any white perverts are going to be okay. your mans in them. So Why well, is it, okay, yeah, Derek, why is it that your boys can do the craziest perverty weird shit and you don't get the wrath as in as when black people do it for your people let us understand why i mean i'm gonna just white privilege yeah maybe is it safe to say white privilege systemic racism do you know what white privilege is yeah there there you go you're 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 hitting the nail on the head no but what is your definition because i want to you know black people have their idea what white privilege is i don't know if white people identify what white white privilege is this is what i consider white privilege when Mm -hmm. i was younger in my 20s i got pulled over in a Saab 9000 with 25 pounds of weed in my trunk yo i didn't even know you was about that life son and then the cop wait 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 stop for a second you had 25 pounds of weed yeah what what the fuck you was doing 25 pounds of weed making cash you was you used to sell weed? Yeah. Why do you make me feel so bad when I want to smoke, son? I don't make you feel bad. What are you talking about? I no. am an ally. Okay, maybe I think you make me feel bad because you don't smoke with me. 
Yeah, that could be it. That could be your own thing. I don't smoke, but I'm I'm a huge advocate for cannabis. And where were you? Where, where'd you? What? What? what East what, Coast. Where? Uh, well, at, like all over. I would drive up from Massachusetts. I would go to Massachusetts, and then I would drive down to Philadelphia, and pretty much in New York and Philadelphia. You did okay. Tell me your story. You what happened? You got twenty five pounds a week. I got pulled over by the police. God damn! Only back then. I don't. A even couple know times you... I got. I got one time my car broke down. This, this both are a great example of white privilege. So the time my car broke down, I was in New Jersey, which I believe is a zero tolerance uh, state at that time. This is nineteen ninety nine, ninety eight. Right. I had about twenty five pounds of weed in my trunk. My clutch blew out. My clutch just went right to the ground. Where the fuck does a person in nineteen ninety nine? Get twenty five pounds of read. I could, I can understand that now, but how the fuck you had to connect? Son. Oh yeah, yeah. Who yeah, gave who, I, who I, gave it to you, son? I did. Who gave it to you? <laughs> <laughs> nah, what's you want me to say? His government? No, nah, I don't want you to say his government. No, damn, I'm so proud that you had twenty five pounds a week. But go ahead, I'm sorry. Clutch blows out. I'm sitting at a red light. I, I call AAA. Obviously, I'm like, I have everything I need. You know. Only okay. AAA, I gotta stop you. I had a nice car. I, I gotta stop you right now. That is very white. Yeah. To have twenty five pounds of weed on you, your car breaks down, and you call AAA. I'm calling my niggas, son. You call AAA. Go ahead. I call AAA. The tow truck's on the way. A cop pulls up behind me. Get puts his lights on. Gets out of his car. He looks in my window. I go, sorry, man. My clutch blew out. I got the tow trucks on the way. And he goes, you know what? Why don't I just bump my car up to your he car? He helped you? And he pushed me. Get this. He pushed my car right into a Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> Swear so to he God. wanted to get coffee? And then he went into the Dunkin' Donuts. Oh. And there was another cop in there. So no dogs? Nah, no dogs. No, Nothing. Not no, even a blink of an eye. No, Not like, they, he didn't call you mister. No. Because that's black people. We all know when they call you mister... You're about to get in jail. You're going to jail. When they call you Mr. This is one one phrase that black people are so nervous about. We hear, could you step outside the car for a second? Like as if you had a choice to say, you know what? I, I just, I don't want to step out. They didn't even look at my driver's license. They, really? Well, I mean, not that they should. You're just broken down. But I'm saying if you were black, they would have you out of the car, look at your driver's license. They'd run your name. Do you have any warrants? You know, it's a, it's a. Me it's and a my friend 40. I'm sorry. Me and my friend Jermaine Johnson. No, 40. We were driving. For, no, 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 no. That's no. your boy, 40. No, 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 no. He has white fans now, so it's Jermaine Johnson. I remember one time me and Jermaine Johnson were driving from New York to D.C., right? We was in a rental, and um, and uh, we were smoking, but we went past this car. Police pulled us over, right? Police pulled us over, and, like, it was one of those, like, he was, I saw the lights going on, but I act like I didn't know what was going on for two exits because I was trying to get rid of the weed and shit. <laughs> and I remember I had a little, I had just a little bit of weed. And one of my friends, it was for Austin's baby shower, he sent me this lotion, right? This like lotion and thing. And I was like, what am I doing with this weed? What am I doing with this weed? And I stuffed the motherfucking weed inside the lotion, capped it back up. It wasn't even that much, you know? But I know they can be petty. And he pulled us over and um, we went from just getting pulled over to what, 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 what do you stop us for? You guys were, driving, social speed limit, whatever, right? And this motherfucker, we didn't give him no signs that we were doing anything crazy. And he was like, no, everything's going to be okay. So we said, you know, you know when something's about to happen. When the police car's behind you for like 15 minutes and 20 minutes. And the next thing you know, we see like the state, the state trooper motherfucker come. They, oh, the next guy comes? The next guy comes. Oh. And then look, it was the next guy come. Then you know, it was like four different guys that came. And they went through and they act like we was like, fucking Nino Brown and shit, man. This motherfucker waited. They brought the goddamn dogs out. They brought the out. dogs. Oh Son, my they God. brought the dogs out. And I knew it was the setup. They was like, okay, step outside the car. Well, I'm going to have this dog is trained for so-and-so. If the dog sits down, <laughs> right, then we're going to check <laughs> oh, further, right? It's I was so like, cold. It don't matter what you tell me what the dog do. He could have been like, if the dog shits, then whatever it was. So the dog sat down. Surprise. Then, surprise, surprise. They fucking ripped it. Everything, everything, open and searched us, and then we didn't have we didn't have fucking anything. So I didn't get the chance to experience white privilege like nah. that. So was that was that the um thing that did 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 that make you uh, say fuck it? I'm giving getting getting over the weed selling life. Oh no! Nah. You kept going. Yeah. What made you I stop? I mean, I got away. Oh, 9/11 made me stop because well, I always I was always planning on just like getting out of it anyway. I wasn't like gonna 
because because people that I knew were just so greedy and just so insane, uh, and they, there's no end to it. Right. There's really no end to it. You know, I remember one time a guy asked me like, "Yo, if I gave you like two million dollars right now, would you stop selling weed forever?" And I was like, "Yeah, of course." And he's like, "Nah, not me. I need like seven million, some houses." But you know what? Some people like, and I know this particular in my case because my dad was a big heroin dealer. You know, and I know he had and and, and his uh, drug dealing. Uh, years and days that he made enough money where he could say I could just quit but you know the same way that you have addiction to using drugs I think people that's in their life get an addiction to making that type of money the oh, lifestyle yeah, it's, it's hard to get away everything. from Yo, my father it's easy was, money for some people Yeah, it's really it, easy money like that's what I'm saying you look at me and you're like what you did that it's like bro I had to talk to like two people a week yeah, yeah. I've had when I was growing up I made up, a lot of money when I was growing up that was like I know this sounds weird for some people listening but especially in the black community, and I know we should aspire to do other things, but our heroes in our communities are a lot different than a lot of people. Yeah. Like the big dope dealer, you thought that he was the man. You know what I'm saying? You wanted to, you wanted to be like that. And when I was younger, I always wanted the lifestyle of a hustler. Right. But I did not want to deal with the consequences of the law getting involved with that shit. Mm-hmm. Like, I always wanted to be the dope boy, but not selling dope. That's why I'm kind of like, comedy has not, not given me the idea of, I feel like a dope dude, but I always wanted that, the lifestyle was kind of cool, like nice cars, nice chicks, everybody looked up to you, everybody uh, respected you. Because in the black community, like, even when in the case of my, my dad, I knew everything he was doing wasn't legal. It was certain things that he had and he did. I was like, this is not no regular motherfucker. All right, yeah, right. You into real estate. I'm going to tell you a, a sign of that. I knew my father was... Was he uh, into real estate at all? Did he like... Probably so. Yeah. Probably so. It can but, be a good cover up. I know people yeah, that got it was into good cover real, up, estate, real but estate. I remember when I went to his house because him and my mom were not living together. I went to his house in Atlanta, Maryland. And this was like a long time ago when video arcades were like popping, the video arcade shit. And everybody wanted to be able to go to the video arcade to play the games. And I was like, this motherfucker on the next level. Because this motherfucker had in his house a Miss Pac-Man machine. Oh, shut up. That's I'm like talking about the one that you... Shit. Son, the one that you sit down, the ones oh, that was at Pizza Hut, son. Like a table. The table joint. Oh. He had two of them, and he had the motherfucking asteroid joint. I was like, I don't give a fuck where this nigga get this money for. He is living fucking life. My father was always living life, and my father always had chicks. And a dip, it, you know, I, I, I said this on another podcast, like, why is it that some of the, the, the good women, the church women, be attracted to the bad boys? Because if you look at the way my mom was raised and how opposite they were. My mother was a church girl. You know what I'm saying? She was in the church. She was all about the school. And my father was just motherfucking cool ass, dope dealing motherfucker. But they made it, they had a connection. But it's that philosophical thing of like, it's not all bad or not all good. Some, and some, as you know, some dope dealers are morally amazing people. Like yeah. when the weather when the when the weather shuts down in Texas and the electricity goes out, there's probably some dope dealers out there that's giving them money. that's giving away money. John giving Gotti away was food. one of those. John Gotti was right. one of those guys. You know that he was into a lot of crazy stuff. But Fourth of July, he did the fireworks for the for the for the neighborhood, and he was like that neighborhood. He was like the folk hero. So what what do where do we separate the line on who we respect as a people that we look up to? How, 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 where do you draw the line? What do you think you draw the line? I think intention is is a big part of it, um, and and really just really critical critical thinking is so important right now. There's not a lot of critical thinking in the world. People jump the gun on everything. It's like, oh my god, he did he did what? I believe it. You know, it's so interesting that you'll know a person. Like it's so interesting because you go to these neighborhoods, or whatever, and you know a person, and the police and the police say he's this person, but to the community, he's somebody totally. Yeah totally fucking different right. you know and, I, bla- and black people on a whole get a get a quote unquote bad rap in society you, you know I grew up in Philadelphia I remember seeing the move bombing racist. you know the move racist the, the move bombing Philly racist yeah bad. the Philadelphia police dropped a bomb on the move house and, and the perception on the news was all oh, these like 
revolutionary, you know, anti-government, you know, just all bad. And then when I was older, I met like Ramona Africa and some of these people and you realize, oh, shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're all anti-government. Why wouldn't why I be anti-government? They dropped a bomb on these people's houses. Yeah, I know black people have a, re- a lot of reasons why they would be um, anti-government that we won't get into. But yeah, but on- I mean, oh, but to be fair, like just to just to prove that I'm educated, they're not anti-government. Oh, come on as with much the proof that you're educated. You say, I know you're educated. They're Somewhere anti-zoo you gotta prove and it. shit like that. They don't want. Animals. Is that the same as saying just to prove that I'm really white? White. What does that mean? I'm to prove that I'm. I just don't want to sound ignorant when it comes to move because I feel like they're important, you know, and I, and I know that they're they do really valuable things for community for the community. You know what? You got a heart. Okay, you do too. No, but I'm not. I, it's not usually expected from somebody from Philly, son. Because yeah, y'all are some but nasty I mean, people. I'm not really. I'm, I'm a suburbs kid. Yeah, because you was like when Black Lives Matter was popping off. You was masked up on your bike going out to the Black Lives Matter. Yeah. What was? What is your connection? I'm just curious. Why do you? Because you could. A lot of people could have. When the Black Lives Matter thing, a lot of white people could have fell back. Like I'm just let these people figure this out themselves. What made you so compelled to be supportive of everything that the Black Lives Matter movement meant? I mean, for me, like uh, I've always, like I would listen to Public Enemy when I was a kid, so I was always like absorbed in. You ever had a black girlfriend? Yeah, not a black girlfriend, but I've dated black girls. I never. I've only had a few girlfriends. What's your like, definition of dating? Because some people think dating is dating, but it's not really dating. It's fucking. You fucked a black girl. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you nervous about it? I never asked you this question, uh, son. I asked you the difference for me. What's the difference? <laughs> what if, like, I know this is crazy, but did you, did you, what, yeah, like, what, 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 what's the what, difference? Yeah. Between white girls I mean, and black girls? Yeah. I think, as far as my experience goes, black women are like, like, wilder. What? Yeah. Oh my God, who is this black chick? She must have grew up around white chicks. Maybe, Wilder, maybe, Wilder than okay. Amy, Becky? No fucking way. We might be onto something, Donnell. No, 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 no. No, seriously, maybe white women are more crazy with you because you're black. I'm pretty sure. And, and I'm then dark black women too. are more crazy with me. And I'm dark skin me, too. Because I'm, I'm white. Pro- I'm dark. Let me tell you, I'm dark skin. And I understand the whole jungle fever thing, but just something is more intense about that color contrast. This would be a good time to put up that poster of jungle fever, right? I don't know. Not You know what I'm saying? Not that that's against anything, but... It's something about that color contrast, that night and day, that yin and yang, and just like bing, 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 bing. But you're telling me that you think black chicks, black chicks were more, more wild, wilder. For me, yeah, but maybe like maybe they just had something to prove. Maybe they wanted to make sure because they're they're fucking a white dude. They want to make sure to put it down. Just like if a white girl's with you, she wants to make sure. Oh, I gotta let them know white, white chicks go down. You know, get down. <sighs> I know that I'm about to be really graphic right now. Right? Get it. I know this is, we don't have a sponsor this episode, and I can say whatever the fuck I want to say. Here comes that viral. I remember when I had the fever. I remember when I had the fever. Yeah. Right? Somebody said, what is it? I was like, you have no idea. This one sentence would have had me fucked up for like a year. I want your big black cock. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Yo, son, 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 son. I'm just, I, I'm just being honest. Like, and I've never heard that uttered out of the mouth of a black chick. I want, listen to what I say and all the bees in it. Big black cock. And it was at the end of it, son. And to be honest, I didn't even know I had a big black cock, son. I'm like, well, bitch, if that's what you want to call it, then that's what it is. That shit had me done. That shit had me done. Because black chicks ain't going to say the word cock. No? No, never. Never cock. Dick. Yeah, but cock. I remember one time I was dating this black chick, and I don't know, I guess because I was coming off my fever days, Right, and I kept using the word cock in, in sentences in the bed. Right, I kept with the carriage and that word cock, and she was like this. She's so she said, "Okay, I get it. I get it. You have a cock." I was like, "Yeah, but you're not saying it. Where did that word originate? Where did that come?" I don't what know. Is, I don't know. That's a good is, question. That's a good question. Know, We're gonna what's have the to, origin of it? Should I look it up? Yeah, look it up. Origin who of the word cock. Who invented the word cock? Damn man, we. I was trying to be. You know what, Derek? This is so wrong, because because I wanted this podcast to be more mature, right? I wanted us to talk about the topics that that trouble the world. I didn't know that we have a conversation where I had you looking up the word cock. Pause. 
But people need escapism, man. People need to get escapism. away. People need to get away from the fucking troubles of the world. You know, they need to laugh and have a. They need to hear. You know how you get away from the world, the, the troubles of the world, when you hear big black cock. I'm <laughs> exactly. saying all of your troubles. <clears throat> when you hear that, your, all your troubles are gone. But do you think it's good? I'm trying to change. No, no, no. Try to try to change the image. But I want to talk about. Are you really looking up? What are you looking up? The origins of the word cock. It should. I def, I, it definitely would be like. No results. If you do it on um, Urban Dictionary, nothing's going to pop up. Oh, it, uh, it comes from a, 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 a bird, obviously. I forgot a bird. About that. Come on. Who, oh, come on, Terry. Come on. I'll just tone your white down right now. <laughs> there you go. See, what, what is the etym- etymology of the word cock uh, penis? Right. Um, all right. No. This is no. what we're looking for. We're doing research. It's a fun. One guy in a comment wrote, rises in the morning. That doesn't give us a definition. I know. And this is, I want everybody that's listening right now to understand this is, this is a mature conversation. <laughs> this is the growth of the Donnell Rollins show. You went from white privilege to big black cock. No, we real went to fast. white privilege. We went to Black Lives Matter to uh, big black cock. And now we're at the point where we're trying to find out the origins of the word cock. This does not represent the maturity level or the growth of Donnell Rollins. Because Donnell Rollins has turned into, did you know this, Derry? What? Did I do a, a Instagram Live early morning, right? I love it. It's a good thing. It's a good place because I get to, people get to live vicariously through me. Some people call me weird because they're like, wait a minute, you're up at 6 o'clock in the morning. There's some people are of the notion that he never went to sleep. I have went to sleep, but I wake up. I wake up very early, and I, and I, and I, and I, and I, and I make these, I make these, Treks early in the morning, and and I try to tell take people to places like we've been. I've been having people from Australia, England, Africa to, to chime in, and then what I'm finding out is that for some reason when I do these shows, I always wake up and feeling funny, and when I go in on these lives, I want to be funny, but for some reason I don't know what it is that every morning there's something that happens that's dark. Or just shifts the entire gears of the direction I wanted to go. Because I want everybody to be happy-go-lucky. Like the other morning I did one. And this guy called. And he was talking about the relationship he had with his baby mama. You know what a baby mama is, right? Yeah, for sure. Definition, tell me. Baby mama. Woman that you're in a relationship with. Have a baby, but don't stay in a relationship with her. But, you know, a relationship. Some of them don't even. Most baby mamas don't start in a relationship. Oh, okay. Yeah, the Urban Dictionary is somebody you smash. Unfortunately, you had a kid with them, but you reap the benefits of producing and bringing a beautiful human being into this world. So it's kind of like a good bad. Yeah, baby. A lot of people don't like to use the term, but it's all type of baby moms. Like my brother, my middle brother. I've talked about this on podcasts before. Educated guy, Brown University, Georgetown Law, and um, his baby mama. He doesn't like that term. He likes to use the term the mother of my child. Which one are you talking about? My baby mama. I think baby mama is like kind of negative because usually when you say the ba- word baby mama, it's something negative. Like, I can't stand my baby mama. I never saw it as negative, but now that you said that, I can see it as negative because yeah, you're, you're got- like, I just smashed this chick. Yeah. And now, but we have now a baby. She's my baby mama. Yeah. Yeah. You but have to be friendly to her. You have to be friendly if you want to get some ass. You have to be friendly if you want somebody to experience the big black cock. Everyone <laughs> No, I was that. saying because they're raising your child. What do you mean? Because there's the mother of your child, so you want to be nice to the mother of your child, right? Here we go. I mean, you don't. Okay, I mean, let me tell you this. This we're getting is getting off not topic of the to live. Me. No, this but. is not related to me. You said you want to be nice to the mother of your child. I was saying, generally speaking, somebody would want to be nice. I wasn't saying you specifically. I think there are people out there that want to be, but circumstance circumstances exist where you can't. I can imagine. And well, I you were, like you were saying, there was a guy, you were on a live with him, his baby's mama, carry on. That's because I think it fits, right? Not baby's mama, his baby mother. His baby mother. Yeah, he called and he was like, it was weird because the young dude, he was like, yeah, man. This is what, he started off, he, was like, he said, my baby mama is retarded. Right? Yeah. And if I was a person that had issues with a baby mama, I'd be like, I would have automatically agreed. And I shut him off immediately. I was like, that's unfair to say. We don't know anything about it. Uh, retarded is a very insensitive, um, uh, 
non-politically correct term. It's an easy but, term. It's an easy term. Yeah. But then, but then my ass said, "What did the bitch do?" Right? <laughs> no, I didn't say that, but because I didn't want to jump the gun and just assume that whatever the situation was, it was her fault, right? And for whatever story you have, there's always, there's always another side of the story. And I said, what makes her retarded? He was like, he went on and on. He was like, yeah, man, she out there getting it popping. Still didn't pick sides. And I was like, usually when a guy, a lot of times, when a guy says their baby mother's crazy, it's probably for a reason. It's probably because we do force, um, uh, uh, women into that psychotic state and then we want to pull back and say we had nothing to do it. That bitch crazy. Why she crazy? Because I came in, I was supposed to come home on Tuesday. I came home three days later with condoms in my pocket and my face looked like a clown. I had lipstick all over myself. She crazy. I don't know what she thinking. You know, but I gave her the benefit of the doubt, but I needed to know more. Come to find out, he said yeah, she slept with her sister's boyfriend. I was like, damn, that's still not enough. He said, and she fucked 50 guys. And I'm like, where did you find this information? I was like, this sounds like some Maury Povich shit. You know what it was? A relationship that found out the uh, 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 status of if this kid is his or not through more. He was actually on the Maury Povich show. He was? He was on a Maury Povich show. Wait, you're not the father of Maury Povich? Type? He was on the, I, I felt like this, like, when it, came, it comes to, and it's always, how many of these bitches name these babies Tatiana? Because every time they come up with results, it's like Tatiana might not be their first name, but it's in there somewhere. When it comes to Janita Tatiana Nakina Smith, when it comes to Tatiana, Tatiana April Jones, when it comes to, come to, when it comes to, uh, uh, give me another black name, son. When it comes to Jermaine Johnson, son, I'm still good with the Tatiana's, but it's like it's always some type you are, and he was. And the thing about it was, I was like, how do you get to the point where you have to go on the show to figure that out if somebody's a thought or not? And but when I was talking to him, he seemed like a genuine kid, you know what I'm saying? He seemed like a kid, but I, I said, I can almost, I don't know, this is crazy to say, but I almost could feel that relationship I was like well usually when you're a thought like that it's learned behavior it's because it's something or images that you see right and I said that it sounded not even knowing the backstory I said this sounds like it could possibly be a situation where mom is a thought too and this motherfucker said her mother is worse than her I was like god damn so mom is out there thoughting she give these thought images to her daughter. She turns it through a thought. And this kid had a young daughter. The daughter was four months old, right? And then he was saying to himself, he's like, you know, I get on the weekends, but I'm thinking about trying to get full custody. And I don't it care. I don't think it's always a case where a kid needs to be with the father. But in this case, I really felt, I was like, yo, bro, listen to me. Listen to me closely. Do everything. Make sure you got a support, support group. Because if you're going to go to court and try to get full custody of this kid, it's not just gonna be you. What's your support base? Who's gonna help you with it, right? This situation, because I told him, your life is gonna immediately change. If you're gonna be that full-time dad that has 100% custody, and I've seen some guys do it, it's a tough thing, because most of the time, men wanna be free. They wanna be able to do what they want, when they want, but then you got a responsibility of raising a kid 100% of the time, your life is gonna change, right? And I said that it's important for you to get that daughter, do everything you can get your daughter, because the, obviously there's a cycle. There's a cycle, and I don't understand. I could not see how she was going to skip that cycle when mommy was like that, grandma was like that. And even with that said, he never felt. He never said it. Only thing he called her was, only thing he called her was, retarded. I don't. I don't agree with that. But I do understand that some people have a certain lifestyle and they are used to certain things and they see something. And then that's what they favor growing up, you know. Was he on Maury Povich? Um, this is not your daughter, Maury. Did, like all the, those what, shows are the same thing. It, but did he take the test? Yeah, he took the test. Oh, okay. So he is the father. He is the father. You know what I'm saying? But I don't know. You know what? People think that their relationship is going to be salvaged. Like they be like, "We're going to see. You're going to see. What you going to do? Well, if it ain't my, ba if it's if it's my kid, 
I'm going to be responsible. I'm going to take care of the thing. I'm going to, I'm going to do my responsibility as a man. And a lot of times people think being responsible as a man is just the financial support. And it's more than that. You know what I'm saying? You can give a kid all the money you want, whatever. But if she doesn't have the right guidance, and I knew in her in his situation or their, her situation that there wasn't a father figure <clears throat> around there anywhere. There wasn't a father figure in grandma's life. There wasn't a father figure in mama's life. And, and I was like, don't be the guy that's not a father figure in this kid's life. And I told him, I said, you got to save this girl. You know, it's as tough as it may sound. You got to save this girl. And I think that he could, he, if you go to court, he'll be able to justify that. You got to, you could. So why don't you think that she's good to raise this kid? Uh, Your Honor, let's go to the videotape. You've been with 50 guys. If it comes down to like what Maury said that's going to salvage your relationship, your relationship is already fucking dead. If you see all these possibilities, well, I said with this guy this, that day, that day, but I'm sure it's yours. Okay, you hit what you consider the, the bullseye. It is. That's right. It's your baby. It's your baby. What you going to do? I'm like, bitch, I'm leaving you. If I got to go to Maury Povich to find out the status of if this kid is my kid or not, then that relationship is fucking, fucking dark as shit, son. White people don't deal with that as much, do they? Yeah, they do. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, like, yeah, white trash shit, you know, like, you know, yeah, white trash shit. Do you ever, we talked about this before, do you ever think about being a dad? Yeah, I think about it, for sure. It's just, you know, it's just, I, I think I'm, uh, what's the word? I'm um I'm thinking about it too much. You're shooting blanks? No, nah, I might be shooting blanks, who knows. Right, but well, I but I'm just thinking about it. Like I'm I'm precautious. I'm precautious cuz I want to be like aware. I don't want to just like blast off and oh, I'm pregnant. I want to be like But you're married, son. No, I know, but I want to be like secure and own a house or something. You know what I mean? Nah, nigga, let me tell I you, know, that, but, son. You got you know. gray hair, son. Don't do that, son. You got gray hair, son. <laughs> Somebody told me once that um I know that white people, you know what? No, I'm not just trying to disown, you know, like discredit you, whatever. But it's a lot of planning. Like, okay, I need this, I need that. Right. But somebody said one thing about kids: they make you work harder for what you need to do to to, to support them. Right. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying to go up there and just um, just keep you know like but um, keep busting shots or whatever. But yo, I think it's like um, you know, Idiocracy, the the movie Idiocracy, no, I the don't. Mike Judge movie. Um, it that's what it's. I hung out with Mike Judge. What's that? I hung out with my judge. I know I saw that. That's why, yeah, you should check out his movie Idiocracy because it's basically, (laughs) at this point, it's a documentary. But it's about how there's a group of people that are like, oh, I don't know. like, Like, basically, he's saying intelligent people think too much and then they don't have a kid while dumb people are just having kids all day long. They're just like, hey, let's have some fucking drinks together and, you know, and then they have 12 kids. You know who do that too and didn't miss out on kids? Who that? Some bitches is too positive. Oh yeah, you're the ones that I'm not saying that. Don't but they're go too for, picky. They're picky. Don't, yeah, picky, yeah. and then it's like, well, I need this and I need that. Not to say to lower your standards or anything like that, but I know so many women that they so of the belief that I don't need a man for nothing. Mm. I can do this. A man can't do this. A man can't do that. And then as time goes on and on, they start getting older. That clock starts to ticking, and then they're like. Huh, maybe I should not 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 tone it down, but like you do need a man for something. Well, now you don't. You can just buy that shit, you know what I mean? If you really if you have the money. What but yeah, that's You can what, buy you can buy pregnancy. You know what's it's interesting that you said that because it really made me like Um before I had Austin and I was getting up in age where I started being content with the idea that I might not have kids. And if you don't come to that point where you're comfortable with it, it will drive you crazy. Mm. I was like, you know what? I got nieces, I got nephews, I got a career. And like for me, I, I, I've, I've said this before, I ain't even know if I could hit a bullseye, son. Right, I know the feeling. I didn't even know, son. When, I know the feeling. When Stephanie told me she was pregnant, I was like, by who? <laughs> I was like, by who? You're ready to go on Maury. Yeah, I was ready. No, not ready to go on Maury, but just because I haven't had a... When I was younger, I got those scares. But when I, when I was younger, I was very... When I was younger, I was kind of wow. And I had situations where... Man... I know I'm not alone when I say this, boy. 
but I would have had some goddamn kids. I mean, I assume that was the case. I would have. Right. right. It was me being young. It was me being with women that weren't ready for that responsibility. I was not ready for a kid. Then as I got older, I was like, I kept saying to myself, what if? What if? And I had to rule that out because the what if didn't happen. And I thought I was out the, the baby making, uh, the baby making situation. And then I got blessed. I got blessed with Austin. I got blessed with Austin at a at an older age, especially for the black community. Motherfuckers be hitting you hard. You get to about the black community, you get to like the old age of 30 with no kids, they be like, what the fuck are you waiting for? They like, what the fuck are you waiting for, man, old ass motherfucker? And then, I, I don't know one thing about being an old dad, is like, I think sometimes uh, you think you alone. You think it's like, oh, they're gonna be making fun of me on the playground, I'm the only old head, everybody else got fucking hairlines, you got gray hair and shit. That's why if you're gonna be an older dad, you gotta get a lot of white friends. Cause, yeah, white people be doing Yeah, yeah white, white people, people, like, when I used yeah. to take my son to daycare Plenty and shit. Plenty old people. Yo, everybody had gray hair, but that bitch, because they were like you, they waited, they waited for um, the right opportunity. And I always thought I was alone, and to be quite honest, Derry, I was kind of somewhat embarrassed by it. By not having kids? No. Oh, being an kids, old dad? Being an older oh, dad. Oh, being an old dad's embarrassing? You know, you know it's kind of embarrassing, because, you know, the difference is, like, I can't even talk to the people I went to high school with about fatherhood the way they know it. Because their kids are in college and shit. My kid, my, their kid's in med school and my son is in preschool. That's hilarious. And then like, but I'm going to tell you, that it wasn't this moment, but I remember when I was in Yellow Springs, um, David Letterman, Dave Chappelle did an interview with David Letterman for Netflix, right? Mm -hmm. So the next day, David Letterman came to, I didn't know he was coming to our show. And I went on stage and I was doing my routine and I do have a joke about being an older dad, how... When I had Austin's first birthday party, I called my friends and said, could they show up to the birthday party? And it was like, well, if my son can get out of, get out of work. <laughs> and it was a funny joke, right? But I didn't know that it resonated with so many people. But I had did my show, didn't know Letterman was uh, backstage. I get off stage, and when you, I don't give a fuck. David Letterman is a powerful presence. Mm -hmm. When you look at David Letterman, you look at one of the best dudes to ever do late night TV. One of the guys that probably had a fucking dope ass life did everything. Smashed all the chicks at work before me too. He had to slow that shit down. You know what I mean? And then, you know what I mean? Because they all did it. They all like, he hey. A, I think he got in trouble for it. To be hey, honest. you want a job? You want to be my secretary? Get it? Secretary. But um, when I got off stage, I went in the back and I was like, oh shit, I'm looking at David Letterman right in his face. And the first thing he looked at me, he towers over me because David Letterman's like 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, and Letterman said, how old are you? And I told him how old I was. And he was like, uh, how do you feel? I said, I feel good. He said, you think you should have did it earlier? And it was so dope that me and David Letterman are backstage having a conversation about being older dads. And then I was, not that I'm on the level of the financial success David Letterman has gotten over the years, but I said to him, I said, you know, get to a certain level of success in this business. And I know he's looking at me like, what the fuck are you talking about? I say, and you look at all the things that you've done in your life and you realize <clears throat> being a father is the greatest thing you've done or the greatest thing you could have done. And to be backstage, sitting back, talking to David Ladman about all things I could have said, how do you like my set? I never mentioned right. that shit. Right. I never mentioned any of that shit. The only thing we talked about was being older dads and how much that we appreciate and how much it like changed your life. It's just like some sense of calm, a sense of peace, and for some part, it's a sense of accomplishment. Because you can get all the success you want, then you ask yourself, okay, I'm gonna be out of here. Who am I gonna share it with? Who am I gonna pass it down? To who am I gonna pass it down to? Do I want my legacy, whatever it is, or my name to continue? And that, that was the um, beauty of it for me. And then David Letterman, he saw my stand up, and this might be featured in Dave Chappelle's uh, a documentary. He went on stage and Dave, him and Dave was on stage, you know, cracking jokes back and forth. And he said, he said, Donnell is money in the bag. 
and you know I don't have a gay bone in my body, but when he said that, I was like, yes! But it made me really, it made me really appreciate being an older dad because I always say the advantage that my son has, me being an older dad, is that he gets granddad and dad in one motherfucker. You know what I mean? I have the energy of a 20-something year old 30-something year old dad, right? But I have the patience of a granddad, which means that I keep snacks. I don't try to, all that right from wrong shit, like. You keep a little <laughs> bowl of, uh, of candy? I'm old school, some Werther's. <laughs> some Werther's, man. <laughs> Werther's are grand people. Yo, it's like, oh shit, this old nigga got the Werther's. You don't get Werther's from young dads. You get now and laters. You get Cheetos and shit. But <laughs> Werther's, man. And kids know when you coming out that Werther's because that, that pocket be rattling this shit. Like, I'm not going to argue with him too much. If we get to a point where it's a decision, how do I get this kid to shut the fuck up? I know how. Werther. Exactly. It's worth the shot. By the way, did yeah. you ever, speaking of David Letterman, did you ever get to audition to do a stand-up spot? On the Letterman show? No, I didn't because when um when I was coming up, uh, I w when I came up in comedy, I wasn't in that mainstream circuit. I would say probably the first three or four years of my career, I was doing the Chitlin circuit. Right. And I, was, I was doing them underground spots to get you popularity in the black community, but the industry might not have known who you were. You know, I, I'll give you a per perfect example, Cat Williams. Right. Cat Williams in the black community is a dope ass comedian. Everybody know him. He had a fucking run with, he was selling arenas and everything. Right. And white folks did not know who the fuck he was. Right. I'll give you another example. He never did a late night spot, right? He never, he never did a late night he spot. He never did David he Letterman. Came through, or... He never came through. Wow. He came through through the Def Jam era, which was the platform for a lot of black comics to get the notoriety that they hadn't seen anywhere other than in the, night, in the nightclubs. Another person that, um, went through that similar route and was uh, met with a lot of frustration. Bernie Mac. Mm -hmm. Bernie Mac has always been the beast. Bernie Mac used to do a night at a cotton club that would rival any club in the country. He was hot. He was getting older. He was a vet, right? But he wasn't getting, uh, getting the respect from mainstream. I mean, I think they even started a campaign like, and everybody was like, where the fuck is Bernie Mac's show? But then Bernie Mac teamed up with, um, the WB, if I'm not mistaken, was the network then? Yeah. And then he teamed up with a super dope uh, showrunner by the name of Warren Hutchinson. Warren Hutchinson was a guy out of Baltimore, Maryland. He was really, really popular in the 90s. But his trajectory to success, he was more, he was a good performer, but he was more of a writer and a showrunner. And that's when they came up with the um, Bernie Mac show. And that's when the world got to see him. But the black community saw him way, way before that. You, know, you didn't come up, you didn't, you weren't around in the Def Jam era, right? I was, uh, nah, not really. Nah, I was doing my own thing. Up oh, sirens. Do you know, do you remember when Def Jam popped off? Vaguely. I was really unplugged. Really? From, from entertainment, society. Yeah, I was heavy into like nature and psychedelics. I'm in nature now like 20 years later. I love that. No, it's great. It's never too late, you know? But it was interesting coming up um, in that era because... As popular as the black comedy scene was, we still wanted some sort of validation, validation from mainstream. Right. Not like. So where oh, were you when it first kicked off? When the first, when the Def Jam stuff first kicked off, how old were you? And were, how like how long were you doing comedy? Or were you doing? Comedy I probably was when Def Jam hit. I probably was um, like mid twenties, early twenties. You know, and you were already doing comedy. Yeah, I was doing comedy before a short period of time. In fact, when I made Def Jam, I had only been doing comedy for six months. Oh, really? Oh, man, I came out the gates so on fire. Anybody that knew me uh, coming up when I first started doing comedy, I was, like, way ahead of my time. Wow. I was, like, I, I made it. I made. I got the audition in six months, and I was recording it at nine months. And then at my 12th month, almost a year of doing comedy, I was on, I was on um, Def Jam. I mean, but, you're a natural. Like your style is. Uh, have you ever had a bad set? I, I don't. I've never seen you have a bad set. I don't acknowledge set. bad sets. I have different definitions of what bad set is. Some people. What's your version of a bad set? My bad. My version of a bad set is usually when I have a bad set, people don't know it. You know, I'll, I'll be 
feeling bad on the inside. Be, like people are like, I have my <clears throat> my own personal standards, and I could have a set where I'll say zero to ten. I was like a five, and people are like, oh shit, that was fantastic. But I'm really critical of my set. I'm like, some people bomb where they just black out. The jokes are horrible. But the time that I've bombed, it's been because like the lighting was fucked up or people couldn't hear me or I was in a fucking go hard ass ghetto ass club and my mic was low. I wasn't at the advantage, but straight up just bombing because you were whack. I don't know how many times I've had that situation. I have, this is what I call it. I say, I have sets that weren't as funny as the other sets. And why is that? Is it usually, well, here go more sirens. What do we got now? That sounds like a fire truck. See, look, you're being inquisitive. You want to know. I'm looking like, oh, shit, sound like police to me. Nah, it's fire truck. Any sirens represent police to me. What were you <laughs> saying? I was saying, um, yeah, I was just wondering because I know it's the same with a lot of people. I know, like, comics I've seen, they'll get, like, tons of laughs. It'll seem like they're doing great. And then you'll hear them afterwards say to their friend, like, ah, I fucking bombed. That was fucking horrible. And I yeah, know, because your standards are different from what the right. audience expect. Right. You know what I'm saying? You expect to get the uh, to get the laughs, expect to get the connection, but that doesn't necessarily mean we connect. I've been with Chappelle before, where I'm like, oh shit, he was like, yo, I wasn't feeling that one. You know, it happens to it happens to the best of them. But, but you've never on. had a set where it's just straight up like you're doing your best shit and it's just quiet. Yeah, I've had those sets. Oh, okay. But I've had those sets, um, not too often. And they fucking that the worst is when you think you like your 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 energy is a certain place, and you like, oh man, I'm about to kill these. I got this thirty minutes. I'm about to kill them with. And then you know you get comfortable. That's another thing. Not expecting what could happen, you get comfortable. Like oh, when I do this joke, this always happens. Right. Right. And I remember when I had a show where I was like, I'm about to kill them with this shit. This my opening shit is fire. They was like. Get that shit out of here. <laughs> so what I thought was 30 minutes got trimmed down to like 20 minutes. And then they just like, get that shit out of here. Oh. And I never make excuses. I never say it's the audience, right? A lot of times I could blame it on the audience. I was like, it's never the audience. Cause I do believe as a comedian, it's never the audience. You have to figure out a way to yeah. entertain them and get them. But I've had those sets that started off to be 30 minutes, got cut down. I'm like, oh shit. They just took five minutes of my heart and soul of this goddamn show. What the fuck am I going to do now? And a lot of comedians, when that happens, you can tell when somebody's about to take one because you start hearing this shit right there. How long y'all been married? <laughs> yeah, they start going to Yeah, how long y'all been married? Oh, where'd you meet? You like this, please, God. Give me some improv. How long y'all been married? Oh, y'all work together. Oh, look at this motherfucker. Let me tell you something. In the black community, here's the number one segue that can get you out of any situation, son. Just think with these tight ass jeans. Oh yeah. Tight ass jeans. Tight ass jeans and give you enough time to. Get, <laughs> it's like, you know how somebody box and they get hit and they got to get up against the ropes to get their composure. Tight ass jeans would get you like, oh shit, them jeans is tight. It give you enough time to think about it. And um, what tight ass jeans? And another one too. Uh, give it up for the ladies. <laughs> yeah. Yo, that's another one to get you out. Get out the ladies. Ladies are good tonight. Give it up to the goddamn ladies. That can get you out of situation. But once all that shit fucking goes, uh, the worst thing is this is what we're so trained to do as comedians. Like, and I never understood why people say this at the end of their show. They like, you guys have been great. Right. No matter I'm what. I'm like, no, they were shitty to you right now. Where the fuck you got these guys have been great? What are the what's the hardest crowd? If you could think of you know, is it the, hard, what the hardest crowd has been for me? For you, yeah. I will say one of the toughest crowds I've had was it was in the village, and this was a time where I got on anybody's stage, whatever theme was, I went, and it was a gay club, a, a, like a gay club, like filled with like lesbians, right? It was one of them joints. Like this lesbian chick I knew, she invited me there, right? I've never felt the hate that I felt with these women, and these were the type of dykes that hate. Dick. Like they would break out in hives if you even mention big black cock. Cause the only big black cock they notice if it's a strap on. Right. You know, I got a big black cock, they pull out one too. I got a big black cock too. But it was one of the one of the shows in my career where I was like, it was nothing I could have said that would have won them over. 
It was nothing. They were the mean dykes. You know what the mean so dykes are. So you didn't are. do that well that night? Huh? You didn't do well that night? I noticed you're not going to believe what I'm about to say. I bombed. <laughs> I bombed. I bombed so bad. I don't know if I ever told this. Did I ever tell a story about Lance Bass? Is it a story about you bombing? Yeah. Oh, no, this is a, no. Jay yeah. Davis is a, a promoter here, right? Yeah, I know Jay. He had this show at the Pink Taco, right? He used to have hot shows, too. Yeah, he always had hot shows. Yeah. He had bad bitches. He had porno bitches there. He just had, it was just, he used to have the hottest shit out. Mm-hmm. He's, a, he's a great, great producer of creating a good vibe. Mm-hmm. So he was whole, having these shows at, uh, at the Pink Taco. And um, this was right at a time when it was this uh, NBA player that came out and said he was gay, right? And it was just like all these people, Jay Williams, I can't remember his name, but all of these guys was coming out with, I'm gay, I'm gay, I'm gay. And I thought people were just saying that just because it was something popular to talk about or whatever. So, and I was just, this is a funny, this is a, this is a funny thing to make a transition from doing black shows and white shows. When the gay shit was popping, when this coming out the closet shit was popping, I could go to this black club because it was so much in the news, everybody is saying they're gay, come out the closet. And I came out at Jay's show at the Pink Taco. I said, God damn, is everybody motherfucking gay? And it was like a little ha, ha, ha. I'm like, every motherfucker's coming to the closet. I was like, how big is the closet? Is they, are they coming out of Kim Kardashian's closet? Because that's a big closet. Nothing. I did, but I was already in my zone, dearie, of doing these fucking crazy ass gay jokes. So I did not stop. I kept going with them. And then the next thing I know, I was like, is everybody gay? And it was like, they were just like, just standoffish, right? So I'm like, you about to get out of here. I about to hit the whole dairy. I went to this. So where are you guys from? How long y'all been again? <laughs> right, I'm trying to get out of this shit, right? Ladies look good, none of that shit worked. And it was bad because Jay, the worst thing to do is when you bomb and the motherfucker give you the light, you like this. I think I could save myself. Wasn't happening. He gave me light. I got off the stage. And normally when I get off the stage, I'm used to walking down the, the aisle and people are like, good set. Good set. Yo, them motherfuckers was like this, son. <laughs> <laughs> they was turning their head. And usually I can go to the bar. Somebody offered me a drink. Nothing. None of that happened. But the funny thing about it was... Um, I did my shit, right, and I bombed. And then Brett Riley went up, and he murdered. He murdered. He, like, murdered the room. And I remember him being that night. I went to the bar, and nobody was being friendly me with anything. I was like, yeah, it's time for me to get the fuck up out of here, right? And I left. And I ran into Brett Riley um, about two weeks later. I said, yeah, remember that show we did at Pick Taco? He said, yeah. I said, word on the streets was, uh, they didn't really like me. And he said, they didn't. What I didn't know that night, uh, the crowd was like 75 people. Uh, um, what's the guy, the, the, um, the guy I was talking about earlier? Um, Lance Bass. Not Lance Bass. What's that insect? What's the motherfucker? Um, Lance Bass, right? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, Lance, Lance Ins- Bass. Am I saying from, it right? He, he's from Insync. Yeah. Okay. Lance, but what I didn't know was that when I was looking at the order, I was like, "Is everybody gay around this motherfucker?" It was Lance Bass. Was Sixty people there. Lance Bass was celebrating his birthday with forty-five people. Right. So I was like, Jay. I was like, Why didn't you fucking give me a warning, right? He was like, I said they didn't really like me. He said they didn't. I was like, how do you know? He said, because they said it, right? And he said, this one guy came up to him and said, we really enjoyed your comedy and you took some chances. But they didn't even give me a name, but they said, but the black guy. Uh. <laughs> Yo, they call me black. The black they said, but the black guy. They said, he just kept going on and on oh, and on. But it taught me a lesson is that you're only as good as your last fight. And you don't know what might have worked. That's why you can't get in the habit of knowing something's going to rip. What worked before might not work then. And I was very precautious on how I would enter a show 
after that, like, don't assume that this is your fire shit. Right. And if your fire shit is not working, you might have to shift your gears, you know? Mm. I think... What's the hardest black room? Back in the day? Yeah, or in general, like... Now, I don't really think that there are any super hard black rooms right now. Um, I mean, uh, not for you, but... Maybe yeah, in general, people. I don't think it's okay, too much. It's not the okay, same. what people would, what, it used to be tough. What I would, what people consider was a tough room was D Ray's uh, Monday uh, Monday night, the Monday night show. That was considered a tough room. I heard about shows where they would like jiggle keys if you sucked. And Yo, all I've shit. heard about shows motherfucker pull guns out. So, oh. but now nah, uh, more better, much. more better Mondays. It was like it's like, and, we, and it was done here at the Improv, one of the longest lasting. Uh, urban shows that you want to say. I think it had a run of like 25 years. And this is the thing about some of the black rooms. They, they get tough because a lot of times it's such a spectacle. It's on an off night and women love comedy. So you get a lot of bad chicks coming to the show. So the guys, most people aren't attracted to the show. They're attracted to, uh, to uh, it being a hot spot. They're attracted to like, oh shit, she got a fat ass or whatever. Right, right. And yeah, that's tough. Thing, yeah, when people aren't there to see comedy, it's it's hard. They're coming to see ass. And then a lot of times you have these rooms, like when you have a black room, a lot of times um, people get connected to the host. The host knows how to work the room so much that you get excited about the host more than anything. And some people can make the room just about them. Right, You know, right. so it doesn't matter who goes up. It's going to be a tough situation. That's like a lot of black rooms in, in general. It's like the black audience, they feel like this. All right, make me laugh. Mm. You better make me laugh. You got to break them down. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, it's a tough situation, but you won't get no better gratification and feel good is when a black room is on your side. Right. It's like as much as, some white guys won't fuck with it. they like, fuck that, it's a waste of time. But once you can get those orders, that's what I respect that's crazy. about. I feel like it would be the best room if you're a white comic because it's such a genuine. It's like you know they're. It's a real deal. They're you're on your. Them. They have to like you. I if remember when Bill Burr laughing. first started. Right. Bill Burr. One thing I was so impressed about Bill Burr was Bill Burr would rock all the rooms. Right. He was a complete comedian, and for me, I came from the black circuit, but I always wanted to be able to go to a white comedy club, a mainstream comedy club. And not have to alter my set or anything, but deliver this. That's when you know you're in a good place. Right. Where you don't have to switch your shit up and right. you got a type of material where it where it would um where it would kill small rooms, anywhere. big rooms, yeah. black rooms, mainstream rooms, funny, underground rooms. Funny story. C a CK story. Louis C. K. story. So uh I remember I had I had been on the road for a while doing a lot of shows with Dave Chappelle. And that audience is predominantly white. Like, you could guarantee that 85, 90% of the audience is gonna be white. But I, don't ne I never wanna get out of touch of where I came from. So I would always come here on Monday. I had good things, TV shows going on, like stuff that I didn't have to do, but when I come, it's just because I wanna be able to connect with my people. So I was like, yeah, what better night than Mo Better Mondays? So I drove down here, right? And I'm looking outside, outside and it felt weird because I didn't see no Lambos outside. I didn't see no motherfucking Bentleys. I saw like Prius, Toyotas and shit like that, you know? And then I was like, what, the, this shit feels different. So I pull up to Valet, I forget his name, I call him Poppy. So I was like, I put outside Poppy. He was like, first thing he ran up to me like, Poppy, Poppy, no black knight. <laughs> He was like, I, I was like, what? He said, no black knight. I was like, what do you mean no black knight? He said, no black comedy. And I was like, who is here tonight? And then he showed me the list. He showed me the piece of paper, Louis C.K. And I said to myself, oh, that's my nigga, right? But evidently, Louis, Louis C.K. is like one of those draws. Like if he call on any night and say, what's going on? It's uh, gays are us. He could bump the whole shit, right? Mm -hmm. But I've never seen a motherfucker bump every black comedian in the city. The only person I saw that had was Michael Collier. Michael Collier had a purple suit on, right? I don't even know what he was did, doing with that. And I was like, oh shit, I was like, this motherfucker Louis C.K. fucking bumped an entire night. He bumped wow. nigga night. <clears throat> and I was like, and I'm a fan of his, so I went inside, and it was so weird to go through those doors on a Monday 
and see all these white people, right? I was like, oh shit, this motherfucker got some juice. And I walked past, not the stage, I walked in the back, going over to the sound booth. And then I was like, oh shit. And I wanted to so bad just yell out to Louis C.K., Louis C. K., Black Lives Matter. I was like, this could be so funny. It was so interesting to me that I went outside the room. I called Chappelle. I was like, yo, son, Louis C.K. just fucking bump nigga night, right? <laughs> I was like, yo, sh should I yell out Black Lives Matter? He was like, man, that should be funny as shit, man. But I didn't do it. And then the next time I saw Louis C.K., I shared that story with him. And he thought um, it was funny. But I thought it was a get back for him because he said he remembered one time when he was like really getting into doing the black rooms, right? And what happened was he went to uh, Chocolate Sunday. That was the Laugh Factory one. Laugh right? Factory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now Chocolate Sunday is a different animal. Why? Chocolate Sunday is like the kids that grew up with both parents. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's something different about Chocolate Sunday. It was black, majority black, but it just had a different vibe. It wasn't like Mondays was the hood. So he got on his high horses, like I could rip any black crowd, right? Then he went from Chocolate Sundays and then he came to Mo Better Blues the next day. And I think that's when he hated black people for like a week, son. So I thought him coming back and bumping Black Knight was just a get back. Like, uh, I'll teach yeah. you motherfuckers not to fucking respect my shit. But it was a funny story. But I think it's like. Have it's, you ever rocked in front of like a hip hop group or, uh, or at like a music night or anything like that? That's pretty hard, right? I, I did, uh, what was it, DJ, DJ Green Lantern? Uh -huh. DJ Green Lantern, I'm mistaken. This is a, was an interesting show. It was a show where, was it Green Lantern? I may be wrong. It was a very popular DJ in New York that used to do these Asian nights. Okay. Right? And it was just like them partying and everything. This was like, uh -huh. a rich bitch was popping and shit, right? And they wanted to bring me on stage, right? And there's all type of Asians in there, right? And I just, I remember I went on stage and I started fucking rapping in Korean, son. Oh, that shut it down. Yo. Oh, that would shut it down. I don't know. It was a mix. It was curse words. It was happy birthday. It was <laughs> it was all type of shit. But I was doing it on beat, and the motherfucker was like, oh, I go, I go. That was one of those shows. But I performed. I performed on, um, I performed on all type of platforms. Yeah. I, I, I always... You're 30 years in the game. 30 years in the game now. I'm a samurai of this shit now. But I believe in what makes you a, a, a solid comic is like, I never really respected the comedians that only can work one crowd, that only perform on certain crowds. Everybody's not built for it. But it's something to be said when you know, literally, you just take, just give you a fucking audience and then you go work your shit. It ain't like, okay, how many black people there? How many white people there? Is it Asian night? Can you go in front of any audience and destroy that shit. Can you, like this is a phrase I used to always say, go hard or go home. And that applies with anything in life, go hard or go home. In life, you gotta be ready to go hard. I support that. I support the fact that sometimes in the darkest moment, there's some light in it. I, res I, I, I respect the fact that you may see things one way, but it might be a bigger picture later. And I'm so much of that notion. A good friend of mine called me, and I'm going to end with saying, is this what I mean when I say go hard or go home? A good friend of mine called me and said, Donnell, I got some news to share with you. It's so I'm so excited. I was like, what? She said, I got fired from my job. And we both celebrated at the same time. We was like, yes! You know, you never know when the next thing in your life is going to happen. And this is like, I don't know, words of encouragement or whatever, whatever, but to people that are listening or watching right now that sometimes what you think are the worst things that could happen in your life could turn out to be the best things to happen in your life. And it's important to know your focus, keep your focus, stay motivated, stay inspired. And remember this, the last words I'm going to say, Donnell Rollins told you, go hard or go home. That's the Donnell Rollins show. Thank y'all for listening. Peace.